Welcome to the American Theatre Wing Seminars on Working in the Theatre. These seminars are coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York on 42nd Street in the heart of theatre. This is a series of programs that are offered to you by the American Theatre Wing. We bring them to you twice a year, in the spring and in the fall, and we are trying to bring two students and two people in the theatre a recognition and a need and a desire to understand what involves going to the theater and what is important in working in the theater. The panelists are comprised of knowledgeable people, all experts in their field, and the audience is made up of students from universities in the tri-state areas, members of the theatrical guilds, and members of the shows Off-Off-Broadway, Off-Broadway, and On-Broadway. This is but one of the Wing's year-round programs. We bring live theater to Saturday Theater for Children, which is just that, in the schools of the five boroughs of New York, in the elementary school age, in their auditoriums, children buy a ticket and are committed to going to the theater on Saturday mornings to see a live professional show. They make this agreement with themselves, as it were, in place of television, movies, or whatever they're going to do. <laughs> they're forming a habit, a pattern of going to the theater. We think it's one that will cast its bread upon the waters, and <coughs> we know that it has already produced audiences today and audiences for the future. Another program of the wing is bringing live, professional, Broadway and off-Broadway shows to hospitals and institutions. And to go back to the seminars, the people that are on the panel contribute their time, their knowledge, their expertise to the American Theatre Wing and to you in order to share with everyone the knowledge that they have. I know of no other organization, no other industry where people are so willing to do this. A word about the Wing, it is a tax-free, organization that is perhaps the oldest in the country, uh, the oldest continuing organization. We are devoted to the community being, being part of the theater, and we bring theater to those who cannot come to it. In every sense of the word, we serve the community and we serve the theater. I don't want to take up any more time. I just want to say I'm delighted to see so many people that have come back, not only for the whole series, but each year to come back and learn a little bit more. I'm Isabel Stevenson. I'm president of the American Theatre Wing, and the panel is chaired, as it always is, by Jean Dalrymple, who is member of the board of the American Theatre Wing, Henry Hughes, also a member of the board of the American Theatre Wing. And today's panel is on the production how it all comes together, what makes it tick, and what are the economics of it. Thank you very much for being here. Henry, will you take over? Thank you. Okay. On the empty chair on my far right uh, is going to be the president of the Theater Wing, Isabel Stevenson, who will sneak in there uh, in a couple of minutes, and perhaps sooner. Next to her is Elliot Martin, the producer of Angels Fall, and form, formerly the producer of many of the O'Neill plays, and in a certain sense, the man who, who brought A Touch of the Poet back to, to Broadway, which was the real, a real turnaround point for the theater in the sense that it, it established the fact that if you do a classic, modern classic play, a serious play, that it can uh, succeed on Broadway. Next to uh, Elliot Martin uh, is another empty chair uh, in, which is reserved for Marshall Mason and 
uh, we hope Marshall will be here. He is currently uh, hard at work in rehearsals of the new Peter Nichols pl play uh, called Passion Play. Uh, and he is also the director of uh, Angels Fall, which is the play that we are going to focus on today. And Jean, introduce the people on her left. And I have a full contingent. Isn't that nice? <laughs> <laughs> Next to me is uh, Edward Mulhair. Leonard Mulhair. Leonard Mulhair, who is uh, the... Edward uh, Mulhair is the man who was in My Fair Lady, isn't That's it? right, yes. <laughs> I'm Leonard Mulhern. Um, Mulhern. Yes, I know. Mulhern, H-E-R-N. Right. And uh, uh, he's the general manager of uh, Angels Fall, and he was here when we discussed The Touch of the Poet also. He was the general manager of that lovely play. And next to him is Jeff Richards, who is a very fabulous press agent. And he is the press agent for Angels Fall. And at the present time, he also has uh, On Your Toes and the, uh, the Alan J. Lerner play, Dance a Little Closer. So he's very, very busy. And I think it's extraordinary that he finds time to be here. And we thank him very much. And on the end, is a charming young man who is an artist representative. He works with Bobby Lance, and uh, he represents some of the artists uh, who were in uh, Angels Fall. And uh, he also represents Raquel Welch, a very glamorous lady, and many other interesting people. Very interesting job he has. <laughs> I think perhaps we can get right down to the question of uh, Angels Fall and, and start tracing the the history of this, it has become the, the, uh, the uh, procedure now uh, for off-Broadway plays to achieve some kind of a uh, success and, and good notices, and then for a Broadway producer to come along and uh, uh, bring the play to Broadway, and the circumstances under which the, the producer brings the play to, to Broadway uh, are interesting because they have changed from the from uh, what they used to be, and I think we can go into that by perhaps, I was going to start with um, Marshall, but since Marshall uh, is not here, and Jeff, you weren't involved as a press agent at Circle Rep, were you? No, so, no. so that uh, I think we'll have to start with uh, Elliot and ask uh, Elliot uh, to uh, <coughs> look, to, to explain his part in it as, as he uh, looked at the play at Circle Rep and made the and made the decisions to bring it to Broadway and and what how the conditions of his producing uh, in cooperation with Circle Rep were worked out and perhaps uh, you can help too is the, uh, in the, on the bring some of these details. Uh, fine, uh, I came into the project towards the end of the engagement. Uh, at the Circle Repertory. As a matter of fact, I saw it the final weekend of the production. Uh, Irv Schwartz, who represents Marshall Mason, called me and suggested that uh, I should see the play. I hadn't been able to see it because I'd been working on another uh, production uh, in the fall. Uh, however, uh, Lucille Lortel had done the play at the White Barn in its developmental period. and. <coughs> and uh, the reaction of the community was very, very strong uh, there in Weston, and, and uh, which uh, made me very interested in the project. So I, uh, Jeff and I went down to see the play, as I say, the weekend before it closed downtown, uh, and were really very touched and moved by the uh, sensitivity of the, of the writing and the, and the whole uh, piece. Uh, two brilliant performances, uh, especially brilliant <coughs> performances by Barney Hughes <coughs> and Fritz Weaver, and uh, a play of certainly uh, uh, Broadway uh, caliber on, a, on, the, on the first basis. It, it was a wonderful play. <coughs> and uh, uh, it had had a long and successful run uh, downtown. Uh, I don't know how many weeks actually it played, but I think it opened in August. Wasn't that it? It opened uh, beginning of October, <coughs> I believe. Beginning of October? Yeah. Anyway, I saw it. They're September. limited uh, by... They're uh, limited uh, by uh, subscription. Yeah. They're they limited a, by their... <coughs> uh, um, aren't they at Circle Rep, or are they limited to the length of their... Yeah, run? they are, because they have a season and a subscription. 
-hmm. So they're limited. They they're not limited as a showcase. No. They no, are a showcase. No, it's, no they're it's not a showcase. Regular it's a regular off Broadway yeah, production, right. and they, they run for a certain amount. But it, it uh, was a play that was so successful downtown, and they were turning away 60 and 70 people every night. Now, it's a, what, a 199 seat theater? About uh, that, yeah. Uh, so it's not. Uh, uh, something that you evaluate in terms of filling a 1,200-seat theater. But on the other hand, the <clears throat> public's reaction was very, very strong. And when Jeff and I saw the play, we, we thought this was a magnificent piece. And uh, so <clears throat> this was, uh, uh, I believe, in no the end of, the the end end of, of the November. Of, yeah. uh, now, uh, if you decide to bring a play uptown, at the end of November, it means that the very earliest you could do it would be either just after the first of the year or perhaps squeeze it in between Christmas and, and uh, New Year's. And uh, that really was not possible under these circumstances. It would, mean to, <coughs> it would mean moving the play within what amounted to three weeks. Not enough time to promote it and uh, really not enough time to uh, get the production ready. The scenery was uh, in absolutely wonderful. It had been done uh, in Florida, built in Florida. This was a, a, an interesting uh, project because it had been developed in several different theaters. The last one, I believe, was uh, at uh, Lucille's White Barn. But they had the scenery there uh, that was a full uh, uh, Broadway uh, stage set, and that made it uh, uh, much easier to move. However, we this did have... at Florida or at Circle Rep? It was developed uh, at, at Florida, but the scenery. then the Circle Rep, uh, then they, they brought it to the Circle Rep. But they couldn't that use scenery. The, they the couldn't Circle use Rep's a very small scene. They, they couldn't yell. use all the scenery. They no, used they couldn't some use the... Uh, if you noticed on Broadway, they had a, um, a roof over yeah. the, mm -hmm. ceiling. The, the church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That they couldn't use at Circle Rep, but they had it for Florida. Actually, I believe. oddly as it seems, the Circle Rep has a wider opening in their theater than the Long Acre Theater on Broadway. <laughs> so we were able to use more of the set down there from, the, uh, from a sightline point of view than we were at the Long Acre. At any event, uh, uh, once uh, one makes a decision to move a play from off-Broadway after you've decided, well, uh, we have time to promote it, uh, one has to pull the pieces together in a very short time. You have to finance the play in what amounts to three uh, to four weeks' time. And uh, uh, after analyzing the play, I thought, well, the only way this can happen, and I really wanted to make it happen, was to involve people who really had a feeling for this material and had a stake in uh, seeing a fine Lamford Wilson play continue on from its uh, successful engagement at the uh, uh, Circle Repertory Company. Uh, uh, Lucille Lortel uh, had helped develop the play at the White Barn. She was obviously someone who uh, would be interested, and she was when I called her. Um, uh, Roger Stevens of the Kennedy Center uh, uh, thought the play was quite wonderful and uh, said, well, this is a play that I would like to have at the Kennedy Center at some time. I will become involved. Uh, uh, Bernie Jacobs of the Schubert organization uh, thought very highly of the play also, and he said, well, this should be in a Schubert theater. So uh, all of these elements um, were brought together. Uh, also, the, uh, uh, the um, Circle Repertory <coughs> Company uh, had uh, a board of directors that wanted to see the play moved, and they were they became uh, a sponsor. So, it, in a matter of a very short time, uh, four different uh, entities wanted to see this fine play uh, continue its life uh, in New York, and uh, and join me on this this venture. That's how the financing. Uh, came about, and actually it was budgeted at three hundred thousand dollars, which is uh, an interesting figure moving a play from Tenth Street and Seventh Avenue to Forty Eighth Street. 
uh, off Broadway, uh, three hundred thousand dollars. And I did a play in nineteen um, sixty-two. The play was capitalized at a hundred thousand, but it cost us only sixty-five thousand mm -hmm. to uh, produce the play. Was uh, your was your uh, contract any any different from what? from your ordinary contract because of the unusual circumstances of Lucille Lortel being involved and Circle Repertory being involved? Did this mean that, you'd, that you gave a different kind of a agreement to, uh, to the creators of this play than you, than you perhaps would have uh, if you started from scratch? Well, uh, no. It was a limited partnership arrangement. I was the only general partner involved, so that I was, would be the only one uh, at risk in the situation. The other uh, sponsors were, uh, were the limited partners. So that was uh, just as any Broadway production would be. They keep art who, who kept artistic control of this thing? In other oh, words? Uh, the uh, artistic control was the Marshall Mason and Lamford Wilson of the <coughs> So you didn't have the power to make a cast change if you wanted No if you producer wanted to. ever has that power. Mm. That, is, that is the director. Well, while we're asking questions. Limited partnership and general partner. Would you just quickly define that? Well, a limited partner uh, is uh, limited to the liability of his uh, investment. If the limited partner invests, say, $50,000, he cannot lose more than $50,000. Uh, and the general partner is liable for anything, uh, any cost beyond, beyond a certain figure. He is the only one who is liable. You, and that's uh, the difference. Were you splitting on a 50% for mm -hmm. the general partner and then dividing <coughs> the rest among the investors? No, it wasn't that. Uh, uh, it was uh, a little uh, bit better um, for the general. Oh, much much better for the for the investors. investors. It yeah. was not mm. wasn't on a on a usual yeah. uh, basis. Leonard, Leonard, could you uh, say uh, say uh, where? I mean, this figure of three hundred thousand dollars is is this is because come to be a fairly, fairly normal figure for transferring from off-Broadway. Yes. Can, can you say what are the big items that make this uh, what's, what seems like an unnecessary expense? Well, actually, $300,000 today is, is very inexpensive even to move a show. The two advantages we had was that we had the physical production in the sense of a, the set was usable. There was some work that had to be done, some adjustments, but not an awful lot. We had all the costumes. And we had a rehearsed play. Uh, Marshall was extremely cooperative, even though there had been a layoff. The cast was very cooperative. We only rehearsed for like four days before we did our first preview. But I think the public asks, uh, if, this, you, if you sent a, a, a truck down to a circle and, and took the scenery up to the, uh, the Broadway Well, theater, it's a little and, bit more than that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, took the cast in there, all rehearsed and costumed and ready. Why are we spending three hundred thousand? Well, first of all, we had in that budget fifty thousand dollars for advertising, right. and in all honesty, we brought the show in for about one hundred and ninety, one hundred and eighty-five, one hundred and ninety thousand. The rest is a contingency for advertising after we open and for losses during previews and after we open. Is there any one item in this uh, transfer that that uh, is uh, larger than it? Than it possibly well, the, could the, be. the biggest thing is probably the advertising was our biggest item, and the uh, the take in is is always very expensive. That's the one thing that uh, you know the IA salaries are quite high. We didn't have very many rehearsal expenses, as I say, that was very inexpensive. But it's still cheap. The I mean, if you started from scratch, just started. Oh, starting from scratch. From from scratch, scratch. We Easily would have to. Double. I would not go. Six hundred thousand is a, a, f a pretty safe budget today. But even that, well, I mean, Elliot did another set. show this season. With I think it was set. six fifty. Yeah. Yeah. With one set. With one set. Off the top of your, uh, the take-in involves both the transfer of the scenery uh, out of the Circle Rep into the Broadway Theater and the putting it up on the stage. Putting it up, hanging the electrics, and the focusing of all lights and all lights, that. The sound. Uh, would, yeah. Now what would off the top of your head, what would that part of the, of the operation cost? Well, I think that was about altogether about 20000 yeah, for everything. 25. There were other ingredients, though. I mean, when you bring a play from a, a, uh, an off-Broadway contract uh, to a first-class contract, uh, you have to upgrade all of the, all the artistic contracts. fees. That amounts to 
in the neighborhood of seventeen to twenty thousand yeah. uh, dollars. But that goes in the operating budget, doesn't it? No, 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 no. that's all. No, that's a fee. For yeah, instance, the off Broadway director's salary is uh, something like a thousand dollars. On Broadway, it's uh, almost seven thousand plus a guarantee of thirty-five hundred dollars. So that's an additional ten thousand dollars for the director alone. Uh, then there are fees for the designers that. Uh, uh, suddenly the designer is a first-class designer rather than an off-Broadway designer. His fee comes up, and uh, those fees amounted to about $20,000. The additional work on the set alone came to $15,000. Um, so those were essentially the uh, big chunks. What are your responsibilities as general manager? After you had your property, you chose Leonard. What is a general manager? To do well, we, the producer and I, work hand to, hand in hand in every aspect of the production. We sit down first of all and do a budget, and then we try to stick to that budget if we possibly can. And we work on negotiating the contracts. I keep all the books on the show in the sense of keeping the money straight, trying to end up where we're in a position that we can advertise and have some money for losses and that sort of thing. And uh, every aspect of the business end, I have nothing to do with the artistic end of the show, only the business end. And with a producer like Elliot, we work very closely <laughs> together, hand in hand. A lot of general managers, the producers sit back and do nothing. Elliot works very close with <coughs> me on all of that. We negotiate all of the contracts, or the th contract with the theater, and then handle the running of the show once it, uh, once it gets into uh, production. Does a producer tend to use the same general manager? For yeah. each production. Yeah. Elliot and I have done, I think, ten shows together. Mm -hmm. Jeff, as the, um, as the press agent on the show, uh, this $50,000 um, advertising, does that come under you, or is that, is that or, do, or do you have to get other money to, to, work, to do your promotion? Well, that, um, that money is allocated in the budget. It was actually $58,000 we had uh, through the end of the first week of the run at the Longacre Theater. And uh, that was all in the budget. And Louder? Louder. This, this doesn't help you. This doesn't you help? You have to project. Oh, okay. Project. Uh, there was $58,000 actually in the budget. Uh, through the end of the first week of performances at the Longacre Theater. And the budget was worked on with the general manager, with Leonard, and with Elliot, and uh, with our advertising agency, uh, Ash Ledun, uh, which helped us coordinate the campaign and the look of the campaign. Well, isn't the big thing the uh, television uh, commercial, which, uh, did you have a television commercial? We did not have a television commercial because television commercials can cost anywhere to make between $25,000 and $50,000 uh, for a straight play, and then to spend monies on television to use the commercial uh, to get the message across, uh, uh, the budget would have had to have been uh, another additional $50,000 for a two-week period for some degree of saturation. And would did, uh, how did you arrive at the decision not to use a television commercial? I mean, what made you think that the television commercial would not pay. I mean, some, most, uh, at least half the shows do feel that it pays. Well, that subject was discussed, and some of it had to do with the budget of the show, and some of it had to do with the feeling that Angel's Fall was a straight play. And not as many straight plays have television commercials as musicals. It's much more difficult to come up with an imaginative concept exactly. to sell a dramatic play or a comedy than it is for a musical where you can just take a production number and put it on the screen and show a lot of the value and the excitement of the musical. And you didn't really have a big star name in the sense of somebody who was known uh, like, I mean, Mary Tyler Moore, they had, a, they had a television commercial for her, which was very effective at the box office because the minute that her name was mentioned, everybody flock to the theater. Well, now, the people who know Bar Barnard screen. Hughes and Fritz Weaver are mostly well, theater people. By the same token that we did discuss it, um, and Elliot and Leonard and the advertising agency, and um, Elliot pointed out, of course, that Barnard Hughes had been on a television series on Doc, had some recognition on TV. Uh, Fritz Weaver had been in Holocaust. These were perhaps names that were not 
instantly recognizable to the public, but there was consideration given because it was felt that if they saw the faces, they would know these people. It was not, it was not so kind of dry. There was thought given to trying to find monies to consider a television commercial. Well, given the fact that you couldn't do a television commercial, or decide not to do a television commercial, what did this, uh, uh, what did you do instead? Uh, we did newspaper advertising and we did uh, radio. radio advertising. Nothing unusual, though. Uh, nothing. Uh, nothing out of the ordinary. How much of the budget is on media advertising? Well, I have the budget right here. We spent approximately fifty thousand dollars through that first week on um, print. Uh, and we spent uh, seventy-five hundred dollars on radio. Right. What's that, the that rate? That was just up to the open. What is the rate of ABCs in the New York Times? The rate of ABCs in the New York Times is now, during the week, uh, ten dollars and eight cents, and per, uh, line. Per, per line, per line, per line. In other that words, when you <coughs> see a small ABC in the displays, the average cost is about two hundred dollars. What does it cost for the Sunday Times big one-page spread on Sunday? It's about 20, 20, 20 No, it's oh. about 28,000. We took a half page. We took several half page ads. We took two ads. half page ads. One and they cost the us uh, 13250 So that's 26000 for the whole page, right? Yeah. Yes. And we took two of them. Of, of, of media, We're, uh, I'm involved in, in Who Done It, because it represent Anthony Schaffer. And well, they, they do have a TV commercial. Or did that. And, and, and they, it, it's, the cost is enormous. I mean, the play opened, they had uh, money in the budget, but for the first two weeks after the play opened, they did a saturation campaign with those commercials. You couldn't turn on uh, the tele But that cost them $50,000 a week. This is not just to, this just to air the commercial. So they spent $100,000 in two weeks. It's a lot of money. Uh, uh, whether you get a return on it is questionable. Uh, we, we went into this very carefully with the Schuberts and with their computers and, and uh, uh, twice around the park or once around the park, uh, mm. twice. Uh, <laughs> twice around the park, uh, uh, had gone into a big television campaign. So had uh, uh, Foxfire. And uh, th neither show got the, the money, the return back on the investment for sure. television. And it depends uh, how the commercial is made, too. I mean, it's very hard for a straight play to make a commercial, I think. This was the fourth show that I had worked on with Elliot. And um, the other show that we worked on and Leonard worked on, American Buffalo with Al Pacino, we did not make a television commercial. Off-Broadway shows do <coughs> frequently now make television commercials. On the two other plays, uh, Elliot was one of the first producers I worked with that we did make commercials in advance of both productions, and they did not have any appreciable response mm -hmm. before the opening. Right. It works both ways. I mean, the whodunit commercial, I mean, it's stylish, and it costs a lot to make, and they had a big budget. It obviously has helped the show run, I would think, just by, by recognizable, but it's, but it's certainly and very costly. Exactly. With a higher budget. Exactly. Very yeah. costly, and the, the, to get the return. The other way a commercial works sometimes is. We're also involved with Amadeus, which um, uh, representing Peter Schaffer, and they didn't do a TV commercial. Now that play has been running about two and a half years now, and there was never a television commercial for that play ever, until this past winter, where the grocers really started to dip down, and they were even advertising last weeks, and they had made a television commercial for the tour, which had been made, and they said, well. At this point, let's try it and see what happens. But there was a recognizable, at that point, a recognizable actor who had just come off of Winds of War, which they advertised in the commercial. And they started running the commercial, I guess, in Feb beginning of February. And the grocers shot up. Well, I think that's what we would have done, too, yeah. had the but show caught on. But they had to, right, exactly. We would have then gone into a television commercial, which would yeah. have made it bigger and bigger. But they had run two exactly. years without any advertisement on television well, So Marty whatsoever. Gottlieb, who's not a fast man with a buck, uh, uh, is, uh, f felt that the television commercial paid off. Well, on, what, on, on, on Who Done It? On Who Done It. Well, on Who Done It, it was... Well, he's not. That's no, that's, that's, that's not Morty Gottlieb. That's not Morty. No. no. And on Who Done It, there's a great deal of money behind yeah. Who Done It. No, there's a great deal of money, and it was, there was a conscious decision made 
when the show is budgeted, when the show is capitalized, that they would make a television commercial. The commercial was made while the show was in rehearsal. The airtime was bought while the show was in rehearsal. They decided, when we start previews, we're going to start the commercial. And they, I think they had budgeted just for television for the um, preview period and the week following. The making of the commercial and buying of the airtime, $150,000. That was, capital, uh, that was in the budget when they capitalized. And it was a, uh, figuring that that's what they were going to do. They might need it. Who knows what the reviews would be like. Uh, uh, they were opening at that time in December. There were a lot of shows opening at the same time to try to get a recognition factor. Uh, that pays off sometimes, and a lot of times it doesn't. You know, it, it, it has well, kept the show running, never, but it has not kept the show running profitably. It's money whether, back. What you call paying off. Right. It is still running, right. but it's not running profitably. No, not at all. And Angels 4 wasn't in that kind of a position. Not at all. No, no, well, I'm saying all, all, we were situations to, are, we are totally different. We would have had to different. start off with four or $500,000, oh, exactly. which we didn't want to do. Exactly. That was not the way this thing was set up. We would have added approximately 30% to our budget at the very beginning. No, that's, that's the point I'm making. They had to add that much to the budget. Just to produce the play, and the results which is, were really uh, getting not crazy. Very good. The results no, were the results only that they kept the show See, going. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, because uh, Angels Fall had been running for some time and had received a lot of publicity, did you have any difficulty in reviving interest in it when it came to Broadway? <coughs> Sometimes well, it seems to me that, that it's We thought that there difficult. would be more interest, I think, from the media than there was in the play uh, when it came in January. We opened in mid-January when there was less product mm. that was happening. But we did find out that the New York Times, um, which, was, which of course is crucial, uh, the New York Times was very lukewarm about mm. the play. Um, Frank Rich had had mixed feelings yeah. about the play. And they did not feel that they wanted to do an advance piece on it because they had adopted the policy that began with plenty when it moved directly, that they were not going to re-review Angel's Fall. Um, that's a very flexible policy, it seems, with the New York Times, since a month later they re-reviewed Quartermain's terms when it went off Broadway, having reviewed it at the uh, Long Wharf Theater just five weeks prior. But they, uh, they made the decision not to re-review Plenty, and they made the decision not to re-review Angel's Fall. I think it's a very poor yeah. policy. Yeah. Very if poor. you move a play... Yeah. And it's not, it's not a, move a play consistent policy. From a 199-seat theater on 10th Street to a Broadway house, a 1,200-seat theater, it is a different production. Absolutely. It has Absolutely. to be a different Absolutely. production. It has to be more fully... Uh, charged in its acting and in its direction. And for the New York Times to take the position that they're not going to re-review something that moves up, or they choose which show to re-review, I think it's a disservice to the industry. And I, I really do uh, credit a great deal of our, our eventual problem with the New York Times mm -hmm. policy. Let's have one big boo for the New York yes. Times. Yes. Boo! <laughs> uh, Jeff? I, I want to add yeah. something else. <coughs> Don't you think also that this new thing of the critics of the Times and the News and the Post going to previews instead of an opening night is a very poor policy? They go at matinees with a very unusual audience. They never have what I'd call a <coughs> really knowledgeable audience like a first night is. Remember, first nights used to be full of excitement and you couldn't wait for the notice. And, and now the notice has been written before the play actually opens. Well, that, I, they I have gotten like to that. a point where they uh, really dictate when they're going to come, yes. unless there's someone strong enough uh, connected with the production to say, no, you're going to come now or never. When I did The Kingfisher with Rex Harrison and Claudette Colbert, we told them that the critic uh, of The Times wanted to come to a preview, and he said, well, that's fine, I won't be there. <laughs> so we uh, told the Times, Rex Harrison will only be there on opening night at such and such a date. If you want to show up, fine. That will be the only time you can see the play with him in it. Otherwise, if he knows you're in the audience, he will walk off the stage. So Elliot? that, uh, that uh, <laughs> they came, and that was the opening That's night, terrific. because Rex is the kind of actor who builds up his uh, head of steam, so to speak, and he 
it's there on opening night. He may not be there the night before because he's saving his book. That's, that was now, his concept. Al Pacino was the same way. He said absolutely the uh, there would be two nights when critics would come. And that was it. That's right. That's At some point, I'm going to ask all do that. why you, as producers, don't put down a ruling that you go back to opening night uh, well, that was tried. Uh, criticism. Yeah, it's foolish for a, a, a reviewer to come in in the middle of the week or at a matinee there's, and not on an opening well, night. I think, I think some the producers, producers that like it, though. I think they're yeah. afraid of that that's, one night rising and falling on well, the one night. Well, I think that's night. another question. But we've been talking about Lucille Lortels here. We've heard her name. And we're fortunate to be able to have Lucille here because this is where it started, at the White Barn Theater in Connecticut. And Lucille Lortel, who has that theater, as well as Lucille Lortel Theater in New York, will come and I hope be able to give us some reason as to why she did the Angels Fall at the White Barn Theater. Lucille Lortel. I guess you all have heard of the White Barn Theater. Somebody here from Connecticut? in Westport, Connecticut, and it's on uh, Lucille's estate, uh, yet it's a uh, non-profit uh, foundation uh, supported by the citizenry of, the, uh, uh, of Westport who subscribed to it. And uh, uh, Lucille's late husband, uh, Lou, uh, used to be very proud of the fact that this was not just a place where uh, uh, Lucille was having fun, but a place in which the, the community uh, supported it and it was uh, on a, on a, on a business-like basis. And I, if I can speak personally, I got a great benefit because I directed a play up there of, uh, ten of Tennessee Williams and uh, many others like me who uh, Lucille's uh, theater has offered uh, an open door to, uh, to do uh, uh, something that we could not otherwise do, and, and I take this opportunity to thank you, Lucille. Lucille, I'd like to thank did, her also, if I may, because I produced a, a play there with, with much success, and uh, I, I thank you very much. That was. Uh, I'm not going to thank you, Lucille. I'm going to ask you, how did Angels Fall come to you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I'm on the board of Circle Rep now, and. Uh, um, both Lanford Wilson and Marshall Mason said they would uh, like to try it out at the White Barn, although they first did it in Florida, in Miami. And when they came to me, they couldn't use that beautiful set. They just had, did you see it, Jean, when yes. we did it at the White Barn? Yes. They had pews, and it was really quite effective. But the most wonderful thing about it was seeing Marshall and Lanford. Every night we played four nights. Thursday was dress rehearsal with an audience, and then we played Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And every night they were there uh, watching the uh, reaction of the audience. Then they would go on the side, on the stage, to see what the audience was like in front. And they would be in back, and they would be downstairs. And the very next day, they were rewriting, writing, writing, writing. And that went on for the four days that they were there. I, myself, uh, didn't think it was a Broadway play. And when it went to Off-Broadway, I was very surprised when Elliot Martin said to me, uh, we're going to do it on Broadway. And I said, what the hell? I, <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, I'll go Broadway. <laughs> I'm known as the queen of Off-Broadway, nothing on Broadway. And uh, <clears throat> although a couple of years ago, I did do sh two shows on Broadway, one with Jules Irving, Tennessee Williams, uh, Streetcar Named Desire, and a long, long time ago, uh, uh, O'Casey's I Knock at the Door at the Belasco Theater. But uh, it's been usually off-Broadway, and uh, trying out plays at the White Barn uh, is not as costly. <coughs> this production costs me at the White Barn uh, less than $10,000. And I got just as much a kick out of doing it there and losing, losing all of it than putting up uh, $50,000 and uh, 
losing not out. having it go. <laughs> uh, I was glad to be able to do it on Broadway, and I was hope my reaction that it was not a Broadway play would be wrong. I really wanted it to go, and I thought all the criticisms were wonderful. When John Simon would say, this is the best play, and you must see it on Broadway, and I said, well, I'm wrong. And I would hope and hope it would go, because now I think it's harder and harder to get straight plays on Broadway to go. And as Niederlander said, he was sitting, or rather standing next to me that night that we were all kicking <laughs> uh, backstage on the Lafontaine Theatre. Uh, he said, I love the show, but people will go to see Cats, they would see big spectaculars. They don't go to see straight shows on Broadway. And what's happening now that the straight shows are doing well off Broadway. I'm sure that if they stayed off Broadway, it probably would have had a long run. So it's a very quiet play in a way. It's not a play that has a, has this, a, a lot of sensational moments. It's a, it's a play that is very thoughtful and quiet, and, and, uh, th and this sort of play has, is, is the ones that have the greatest difficulty, I think, to, to attract an, an audience that has to pay. Uh, what is the top now for you can't take it with you? Is, I think, uh, something like $40 for a uh, ticket oh. for the orchestra. Hey, Lucille. Do you retain any rights when a play leaves the White Barn Theatre and goes on such no. and such? <coughs> this is just a service that I give to playwrights. I don't retain anything. Uh, they have the benefit of having the use of the White Barn. And uh, Shisco, the typist, mm -hmm. was done that way. Terence McNally's play, uh, next. Uh, many plays we do uh, just go further. Uh, the foundation is... Uh, the purpose of helping playwrights, every, every field in the theatre. Well, you and stay away, though, don't you, from the so-called commercial play. In other words, you're more interested in Sean O'Casey and Tennessee Williams and, than you are in, in somebody who has written a... I mean, you wouldn't do a Neil Simon play, for instance, at, uh, at Well, at I, I don't know if I saw a Neil <laughs> Simon play that, like uh, I saw a line for Wilson's. You see, I don't... To me, that was uh, what I would do. That I didn't think was a Broadway show. Mm. That doesn't say that, that it couldn't be, that anything that does uh, play at the White Bar couldn't go to Broadway, because today you just don't know. But that's not the kind of thing I pick out. What happened to the matinee theater series? That, that was so wonderful that uh, you did the same <coughs> sort of thing at the White Barn as you did it. At well, the, at uh, the, the matinee the... series ran for 20 years. And <coughs> when the off-off Broadway came into being, and they could rehearse for weeks and put on a production with sets. And I remember Mel Gussico going once to the matinee series and I thought, that's it, I'm not going to do it anymore. Uh, he didn't quite understand. Uh, Brooks Atkinson, when he started, he said, this is great. But he, he couldn't understand that we didn't have a set for each show we did. And we, could, we had a show playing at the, uh, down at the Delice at that time and we could only do it in the <coughs> present set of whatever show was there. And then we, uh, we weren't, didn't have four weeks rehearsal. They only had the dress rehearsal, which was the day in the afternoon of a Monday. And we appeared, they performed on Monday nights. So comparing that to the awful Broadway, which was doing more or less the things that I've been doing, it didn't seem to make any sense to keep doing the same thing, because they had so much more time. <laughs> To rehearse. Henry, you know, I'd, I'd like, like to go like back to say to something about, about whether a play is a Broadway play or not. Uh, in 1974, I did uh, Moon for the Misbegotten with Jason Robards and Colleen Dewhurst, and uh, I couldn't get a theater on Broadway. The Schuberts oh, yeah. didn't think the play would work. It wasn't a success originally, and uh, fortunately, the Morosco Theater was, happened to be available mm -hmm. because one of its bookings had fallen through. And uh, the play opened to enormous success and uh, played for one year with, a, with uh, not one empty seat. And I was told by the entire industry that it was an uh, absolutely a losing project that I should have my head examined. It wasn't for Broadway. 
perhaps off-Broadway. So it's very hard to... Uh, I know, but Elliot, don't I'd you like to go back to Angel's Fall on Broadway now. Why don't we do that after the intermission? Because the intermission is coming up. I know it is, but uh, I still we have time, and I'd like to come yeah. back <laughs> to this. Because I want to quickly ask you, and then you're going to, I hope, do it more fully. How did you come into this as representative? When did you come in to Angel's Quickly, Fall? Quickly, because the intermission well, will be I here in I represent Marshall months. Mason. I represent him for a long time. Mm -hmm. And... Um, was following the, the, the history of the play, it was originally commissioned, Lanford Wilson was commissioned to do a play for the Miami Festival of the Arts, whatever that was called. And then it went on, and one knew it was going to be done um, eventually as the first production at the Circle Rep. And I went to see the, um, I'd never seen it, I didn't go to Miami, and it w I didn't go to the White Barn, and it was done in, in Saratoga, because the Circle Rep has this, I didn't go there. So I saw it for the very first time at the Circle Rep, and decided that this was terrific and should be done on Broadway, and began myself and uh, Bridget Ashenberg, who is Lanford Wilson's agent, began calling uh, as many producers as we could think of to come and see this uh, play, because um, it's wonderful and it, it has to be seen on Broadway, and try to solicit that. We're going to have to take a break now, and we'll just stretch for a few minutes. Please do not go far away. and. Think of any questions that you might want to ask based on Angel's Fall, now on Broadway. This is the American Theatre Wing Seminars coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. The panel today is on producing. The show is Angel's Fall. I hope that you will have many provocative questions for this highly skilled and highly knowledgeable panel that we have today. We are continuing the American Theatre Wing seminars on working in the theatre. These seminars are coming to you again from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York on West 42nd Street. And today's seminars, one of a series of spring seminars, are made up of the producing team of Angels Fall. We've listened to the performance seminar and the play script seminar, and now we've brought it all together on the producing seminar. The panelists are the management, the press, the representative, the general management, all that makes the production come to light. It all starts with the producer, and then it goes on down the line to the last person who has a say, and I guess that's probably the public relations man. Our, our uh, co-moderators again, it's Jean Dalrymple and Henry Hughes, and we're going to continue on the Broadway production of Angels Fall, produced by Elliot Martin. Would you please go on, Elliot, and continue on where you were? I guess we'll go right back to the Broadway production of Angels Fall. Well, perhaps I could put it in perspective, Isabel. Uh, I think that uh, we've talked a lot about the uh, dollars and cents of, of, the, of, the, of this uh, play. And I think we need to now address the uh, quality of the play itself. And uh, from uh, Elliot, speaking for, Martin, for Marshall Mason, who, uh, with whom he's presumably uh, discussed the play at length, the, the, the things that the, the beauty and the uh, promise of this play and uh, the, the reasons that it did, did not uh, have a long run on, on Broadway. Well, uh, when I uh, saw the play uh, and then met with Marshall, of course our conversation uh, started off with, does this play belong on Broadway? Does it belong off Broadway? Uh, what would you have to do as a director to make that transition if we go to Broadway. Um, and uh, But could it, you, before you go into that, could you fill us in on, on what, I mean, a lot of people haven't seen this play. Now, it, what was it about? Why is, why is it topical? Uh, why, what well, I mean, uh, I can't tell you the story of the play and the length of time we have. It is a very sensitive piece about six people coming together in a, um, uh, in, a, in a church uh, in the southwest, uh, and they are there because the road has been blocked due to a nuclear uh, accident in, in, uh, in nearby community. And this uh, kicks off 
uh, the, one of the uh, protagonists is uh, uh, the character that Fritz Weaver plays. It's a, he's a professor from uh, an Ivy League school, and he's uh, run himself physically into the ground. He's out there to have a, uh, some kind of a rejuvenation, he hopes, were, and uh, in some uh, local clinic. Uh, and Barney Hughes plays the role of a Catholic priest uh, in this uh, Indian community. Uh, it really is a springboard, though, for six uh, souls coming together and, uh, uh, and coming to terms with their, uh, their life. And it's a fascinating study. It's a deep play. Uh, one wonders if Broadway uh, now will accept a deep play unless you have some uh, yeah. enormous uh, star that just on the, 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 the face of their being there alone <coughs> makes that uh, venture practical. Um, Lanford Wilson is, uh, is a recognizable star in our world of theater. He, he was the reason to do uh, the play. Uh, if one needed a reason. Uh, the public that poured into the theater downtown was a Broadway public. They were, they were adults. They were not uh, the blue jean crowd who had just, you know, come in off the village street. They were people who, had, uh, who were there for an intellectual and an emotional experience, which um, uh, Broadway an important Broadway play should give. And uh, so in discussing this with Marshall, who, was, uh, who has done all of Lanford's plays, um, we, we very seriously went into the business. Is this a Broadway play or is this uh, an off-Broadway play? They didn't have anything to prove as an off-Broadway play. It was an enormous success downtown. They turned hundreds and hundreds of people away. And there was a tremendous call for it. So from that point of view, just to move it to another theater, uh, and also uh, they would have lost the cast. Fritz Weaver and Barney Hughes would only have stayed for a few weeks' time. So that didn't make sense. Uh, they felt that it was a, um, a company production and would require those performances to fulfill this play. So. If it had moved off Broadway, it would have, uh, could have run for four weeks with uh, Barney and Fritz, and then there would have been replacements if you could replace. It's very difficult to replace off Broadway, uh, or any place as far as that uh, is concerned. Um, uh, the the, uh, the the property really uh, is of Broadway caliber, and that's what the decision was. Marshall was faced then as the director to bring this play from a 199-seat theater to an 11, 1,200-seat theater. And uh, he had the acting company that was equipped and capable of doing this. Uh, what, as a matter of fact, I felt the play was superior on Broadway yeah, too. Uh, yes. to the off-Broadway production Much because it, it uh, generated <coughs> more energy underneath the performances of these actors and it was fascinating to watch them fill it out and grow for this, for this uh, audience. I think in a small theater, a play seems to be about the personal lives of, of the individuals involved, whereas when you see it in a larger theater, uh, there is a suggestion that these people are, represent something more than just mm -hmm. their personal problems. I think that's right. Uh, but in any event, that was Marshall's job, uh, and he did it, I think, brilliantly to bring those actors to a, to a point where they really filled that house. He had to adjust the uh, scenery to a, way, uh, to a degree because there wasn't uh, the same width of the stage. And that was a mechanical thing that he and the designer went to work on and uh, uh, made it possible. There is a bell in the, uh, in the production that uh, it's, it's the last thing you see in the play where the where the priest, uh, uh, there's a wonderful relationship between the priest and a young Indian uh, 
boy who, who becomes, who is a doctor. And the young Indian has to make the decision about going to a big city, uh, San Francisco, and become a part of a subsidized uh, uh, medical experimental uh, institution or staying on the uh, on this Indian uh, territory and, and uh, administering to the medical needs of the Indians. The, the priest wants him to stay and the Indian feels he can accomplish some great good uh, if he is experimenting in medicine. So that's the conflict between those two. The Indian does leave. He's given the strength to break away from his tribe, from his family, and from the great affection he has for this priest. He's really given that strength by the, uh, by the professor uh, who is visiting, uh, uh, just stopping over for several hours. And uh, so it's, it's quite an emotional uh, moment. Anyway, at the end, when the <coughs> Indian leaves, uh, there is a bell that uh, the priest goes out and rings. Well, it's, uh, there was no way we could uh, do it at the Long Acre. The Long Acre has a, a much uh, uh, a smaller actual theater proscenium than they had downtown. So they had to redesign the set. So we couldn't bring the set, just put it in a truck and bring it up. It had to go to a scenic studio, had to be reshaped, uh, rebuilt to a degree, and um, and a section taken out so we could put that bell in. All of that work had to be done. And uh, uh, Marshall, representing the Circle Repertory Company, uh, truly wanted uh, to see this play on a larger scale. Uh, the board of directors of the Repertory Company uh, wanted it on a larger scale. Um, incidentally, uh, the, the number of calls for this play from all of the regional theaters is just astounding. It is tremendous. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, this play, uh, which got really quite brilliant notices, uh, is, is going to have a, a long life sure. in uh, regional, uh, important regional theaters. ACT called yesterday. They're desperate to get it on their, their uh, schedule for next year. So it, it's an important play. And you know, this has happened with Tennessee Williams' uh, last uh, five or six plays. Uh, here is one of America's most important writers. And, and, and every play Tennessee does just goes out across the country and is played constantly. Just that's as, that's I, true with just, Lanford. Yeah. Just as the financial success of Moon for the Misbegotten turned Broadway around for the serious play, does the financial failure of Angels Fall mean that in the future, plays like this will not be brought to Broadway as as much. I mean, as it, I mean, will you be more hesitant about about bringing the next play like of of this quality, but of this limited appeal to Broadway? Well, first of all, you don't know that it's a limited appeal. I I think I don't think anyone takes a play to Broadway when he says in the back of his mind it has a limited appeal. Uh, it appeals to you. You have to go on your own uh, uh, instincts. Um, I think that uh, I, I, I don't know. I may be a little gun shy. <laughs> and, uh, Elliot, no, how do you right. account for the counterpart of the off-Broadway audience not coming up to Broadway? Is it only the ticket price, or is there yes. something else that comes into it? Well, there's, a, there's a big difference in the ticket price. Uh, you, you, you get a, uh, a Broadway house, and the, and the theater owner uh, will insist on a certain uh, Broadway scale. What is and, that scale? So, well, That's it was $30. For. Okay. $30 for a ticket. And, and that's uh, set by the theater? That's the top, isn't it? Thirty-two fifty on the weekends. Is that and what set, is the bottom ticket? Wait, one, excuse me. Is that set by the theater owner? Uh, is the ticket price set yes. by? We, we Let's try take it we, step by step because that's what we're trying to find here, the, the complete the, yeah, groundwork. I, I, yes. I think it is the ticket price. I mean, now you're going to have a, a straight play with four characters, Private Lives, which is going to have a $45 top. Well, How much was it downtown? I think it was $16. $16, $16 downtown. And you as producer have the right to uh, set the price of the ticket. No, you don't. You don't? Not no. unless you own the theater. The producer uh, leases the theater 
and the, the theater, I mean, you can uh, say, no, I absolutely refuse to have that uh, ticket price, and then you probably will have to find another theater. Uh, God, but, I didn't uh, realize that. Uh, uh, the producer has no control of the box office whatsoever of, of a theater. Well, we did manage. They originally wanted 35 on the weekend and 32.50 during the week, and we got them down to where we ended up, which was a somewhat of a victory for us. But yes, there, there are well, straight plays now that have $35 tops. <coughs> Private Lives will have $45. dollars I, I think, I think Fox is But, is but there, is now, uh, there is a rollback on two musicals coming in. I'm working on one dance a little closer in Showboat, and their tops for all performances are going to be $35, which is 5 to $10 less than most musicals. So maybe this will be some kind of a hopeful trend. Is well, it the producer or the theater owner who has the, uh, decides about sending uh, seats to tickets in Times Square? You know where you can get tickets at No, that's price. the producer, but he has to do it in conjunction with the theater owner. He has to have the approval of the theater owner um, to send them to the uh, booth. How does that work uh, exactly, I mean, day to day? Well, uh, Leonard is uh, yeah. uh, Well, more you send an allotment with. every day. You, I used to sit down with the box office mm -hmm. treasurer, and we'd decide how many seats we were going to What spend. time of day do you do that? Well, it's done pretty much the day before, or like on Friday, we send for the whole weekend. And then, of course, if, if the booth sells out, they can call and, and get more. Yeah. We used to send about 100 a night. And uh, then if they sold those, they would uh, call. And but once more. you send them, you can't ask for some back. Oh, sure, you could. Yes. Yeah. You could, yes. If you, but you wouldn't, if there was a chance of selling that well at full price, yeah. you wouldn't send that many. In fact, you probably wouldn't be sending any. We're going to go to questions in a minute, and those people who want questions, uh, to ask questions, should go to the microphones. But well, we meanwhile, have... Isabel has a question. Thank you very much, Henry. <laughs> uh, of the dollar, can you break it down to see what percentage are union uh, wages, what percentage is a house, what percentage is a uh, press agent, what percentage in, as the producing of the, of the dollar that you get in for a show? You, you, you're asking for money for a show. You're asking for $100 for your backers. Of that $100, how do you break that down? You have to tell someone what that $100 is going to be spent on, like taking a figure. You're talking about the original production That's cost? That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, of the $300,000 uh, production capital for this show, uh, we spent actually $180,000 to get to the opening date. $19,000 of it on. went to fees for mm -hmm. the artistic uh, uh, directors. Uh, $15,000 went to the scenery. Um, you have legal, accounting, uh, pension and welfare. Pension and welfare. You have to tax 41% of pension and welfare to uh, uh, every one of your, of your uh, salary costs. All of the union people. And the take in and the advertising. I mean, they're two of your big items. Your physical production your take-in, your advertising, then you've got your rentals you have to do, then all your miscellaneous costs, your lawyer, your accountant, your insurance, very expensive. Is that of the, the end? Of the operating, uh, we had an arrangement which was very interesting with this play for the simple reason right. that Lanford and the uh, circle rep wanted this uh, project to work. We worked on a basis of, uh, uh, of a, a pool sharing royalty. And the creative uh, people, the, the author and the director and the, I guess the, the producer. And, and the, the theater. And the theater. And the theater. As um, the agent, you're sort of in between, aren't you? You have, you have to talk your clients into taking less it, and no. you have to at the same time say, uh, I, my God, what am I doing to my clients? He's, yeah, what, but, He's toughy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, but ultimately the, the, the task is to get the play on and to try because the costs are so enormous. You have to give a, a, a the pro I think the problem in the theater, one of the problems, it, it, everything costs so much. The investment is, incre is incredible. How are people going to invest in the theater uh, if there is no chance of a return? Therefore, uh, everybody has to be sensible. And the, the, easy, the, way, the, the reason that, the, um, that Angels Fall, uh, uh, one of the reasons it moved, and the reason it could move for 300000 as opposed to uh, to what, besides it having been done, was I think the pool arrangement that the theater agreed to, that the playwright agreed to, that the director, instead of taking their royalty from the first dollar, which is standard, 
if a playwright, uh, on the assumption that a playwright gets 10% of the gross, he takes it from the first dollar. There was an arrangement made with all of the royalty participants that um, there would be a pool aft of the operating profits. In other words, you'd make the, the, the production would make its cost, whatever that was, let's say it's $10 a week to run the play. And they took in $12, so there was $2 worth of profit. That $2 was divided among all the royalty participants on a proportional basis. So instead of the playwright who would normally get 10% of $12, which would be $1.20, he would get a proportional share of the $2. Well, actually, it was based on a 40-40-20 basis. 40% for the royalty uh, uh, participants, 40% for the backers, and 20% for the theater which meant that the backers received uh, quid pro quo with the royalty participants. Uh, Each and every week. You, see, uh, you, yeah, you hear of so. stories of, of musicals like... Uh, 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 what do you say? Same Girl. Uh, right. uh, Woman of the Year Woman was running the, on that basis yeah. for a long time. Well, Woman of the Year started off and it, and it hadn't paid off, right. hadn't paid anything back for almost two years, right? Yeah. Uh, in other words, all of the creative forces received their money, but the backers didn't receive any. So that's what yeah. this pool arrangement sure. uh, took care of, and, it, and it's a very fair... It is. See, uh, a woman of the year that ran that way for, after about four months of the run, because we represented one of the first, it was, the, the, the investors were making nothing. So this, a similar arrangement was started, so they, yes, they have not paid back, and I don't know if they ever will, but at least there was something going back Earth, to they the went investor. into a 40, 40, 20 with women of the They year. went into... Not quite that, but yes, they went into that. The show opened in March, wasn't aware of that. in August of that year, which was, I guess, uh, after Bacola won the Tony, and it still wasn't. They went into that kind of an arrangement. Your costs almost give a justification for the $32 ticket or the $35 ticket, the monies that you've just discussed and how much everything cost with your pension funds and your... Uh, yes, I, I mean, the yeah. theaters are not gouging. It's, it's a very real cost. Well, then what do you do about that? Do you have to bring down the cost? Yes. Do you have to change the structure? The, uh, an, an example of cost, uh, we're involved with K2 because we represent Jeffrey DeMunn. Now, here you have two actors and a mountain. I mean, that's it, in, in theory. But what a man. What a mountain. That play <laughs> costs each week to run $95,000. Now, you only have two actors in that play. And they're not stars. And they're not stars. So the salaries are not, there are, I don't know, they must, they have a, a, probably a dozen stagehands. The guy's throwing snow and the guy building the mountain. You know, the same guy that throws the snow can't build the mountain. And the same guy that, that helps with the, with the rope can't do this. So you, that is the, uh, 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 the craziness of the theater. Do you see any way of bringing your ticket price down? With these salaries, they can't be altered, or can they be altered with the unions? Uh, one would hope so. Well, I mean, one would hope they would. Uh, Isabel, I know that Jerry and Schoenfeld and Bernie Jacobs have always, who negotiate with the unions, have always said that the real thing that they would like to get from the IA is uh, cut across, is permission to cross lines, lines, so that you don't have to have sure. somebody who just does one thing. Uh, uh, and won't do something else. Mm -hmm. and, but of course, it, it's, it, that's a, something you have to put on the table when you bargain, and, and, they, and they say, well, if we take less money, we're not going to give you that. But I think that it would be better to get that than it would be oh, to sure. get lower, lower salaries. I would think eventually when we'll have to. I mean, the, uh, uh, we saw what happened in Detroit. I mean, the, the, uh, unless the, un the unions and management got together and said, wait a minute, you know, Everybody's buying Japanese cars because our cars are costing too much to make. It's, it's getting out of hand. And let's do something. It just happened in the steel industry, where, for, I mean, where that union was, uh, uh, you know, they're, 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 through history, the most vociferous. And they took an enormous uh, cut. They, didn't they took a cut in salary on the new contract in the steel industry. It's not just it the just unions. Uh, uh, you take the New York uh, Times. Well, no, I mean, uh, is there a reason why uh, an actor should get twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars a week? That's you've got to you've got sure. to ask that. I mean, do, do they bring that uh, into the box office always? I mean, it has to go all the way through. It can't. It's not just it the stage. It depends on the particular union. situation. No, it's not just the stage. Of course not. 
But it, then you're saying that it has to be a star vehicle, it has to be an event, it can't be a good, solid, straight play for that price. Well, it depends. So that I mean, if it, then the star is worth the 20, 30, oh, 40,000. But, if we, he brings but we, it have in. A show, we had a show that didn't break at 95, we broke at 60,000 under, right. under the setup that we had. Mm -hmm. But even I mean, 60, 95 is, is very high, there's no question no, about that. But but 60,000 is very good today. I mean, that was It's very good today, but it's still, when you think about well, it. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't really think you can blame the IA. I'm a firm believer that we should combine the property department and carpenter department no, into one department. I don't think this is any blame. I think we're trying to find out what we can no. do but even, about it. Even, even if you say 60,000, it isn't high. 60,000 is a no. terrific break. for. Yes. But if you think $60,000 a week for a play with six, act, six actors and one set, it's a lot of money. Has a Broadway production ever gone off Broadway after a run? Yes. 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 Little Murders. Yes. Little Murders is, is a classic one? case. Mm -hmm. Little Murders opened on Broadway and ran a week. It was devastated. And a year later, it opened at the Circle in the Square under a brand new production and ran three years. Yeah. American mm -hmm. Buffalo. American Buffalo. American Buffalo, Buffalo. Buffalo yeah. Right. Yeah. You can't go directly off Broadway Why? from Broadway. That's what I really well, there's an equity know. regulation against right. it to begin with. I think you have to be off eight weeks, don't right. you? And it has to be a new well, production. Well, you can't, you can't downgrade a contract. I mean, you have to wait. I mean, if you just move... Could that not be negotiated if a play is so, so visibly off-Broadway material and is not doing it on Broadway? Why can't there be another the life immediately? I think you have to do new contracts. Didn't Billy Bishop goes to war move directly? That was a one-man show, though. Maybe it's easier. I mean... That one I did Lucille said or did... Uh, yeah, but that was a one-man show, so I don't know... Uh, it's a different situation. I think we're going to open this to questions now. And the first... Was it a two-man show? Good morning. This is addressed to Mr. Mulhern. Yes. How is the money apportioned on a production in terms of percentages and salaries, and how do you get directly involved in that? Well, we make up a budget in the beginning, and uh, if you would like, I can just give you a quick rundown. It won't take a moment. The physical production, we had $28,000. Fees, that's the director, the designers, was eighteen five. The rehearsal salaries, $13,000. Advertising, 68000 which includes posters and all that sort of stuff, too. The take-in and costs prior to the first performance in the theater, 31000 And miscellaneous costs, uh, which is your legal accounting, came to 328. The total was 191. Now, we brought it in for about 185, so we saved. I mean, this was our budget, and we brought it in actually under budget on that. The balance of the, uh, of the capitalization went for bonds. You have to put up a bond at all the unions and, uh, and contingency for losses. Okay. Did you use up your reserve fund uh, to, in order to run? Uh? We, we ran on our reserve, yes. But did you use it all up? Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. We ran until the money was gone. <laughs> we, we always hoped that we'd start. Well, nobody's ever mentioned the snowstorm which was a very, very important factor sure. in this the show. The show was building at that point. We, we had, had to started now. to climb, and the feeling around the theater was marvelous. And the box office was getting excited, and you could just feel that it was beginning to move. And we're hit by a three-day snowstorm. On a Friday. On a Friday, which yeah. killed that weekend. And not only that weekend, killed the next week. Our sale came to a halt, and we never, never recovered no. from it. You see, that doesn't affect a play that's pre-sold, uh, that has an advance like Amadeus or a play that's established. But we had just opened, so we were, we were just beginning to build into our, into our run. Right. So it was devastating. I'd like to ask a question of Jeff Richards. In your experience as a press agent, um, how do reviews affect uh, the audience reaction and also the box office growth for a Broadway show? Well, um, frequently you'll see people looking at reviews in front of the theater, but uh, after it's opened and after they've come out in intermission and look at some of the quotes. But I think that for the most part, um, if audiences like a play, after a certain period of time and your word of mouth is truly excellent, the play can, can have a substantial run. I think on Angel's Fall what happened is people liked the play, they didn't love the play. That was the difference. If people went out, they said it was a nice play, it was a well-written play, they enjoyed the play, but uh, they didn't love us, unfortunately. So it was not enough to overcome the reviews? 
Well, well the we reviews were very, very good for Angels of the Fall. They were not spectacular notices. Uh, Frank Rich was a qualified review all the way down the line. He loved the performances and he um, loved the direction. Uh, he did not feel it was one of Lanford Wilson's finest plays. The News and the Post were very enthusiastic. They did not come back and re-review it. Newsweek and Time did not like the play. Uh, New York Magazine uh, thought it was the best play of the season. And The New Yorker was excellent and the TV reviews uh, were split. So it got a generally favorable reaction, but it was not unanimous across the board. If you run a play for six weeks on Broadway with uh, a good solid audience, which we had for that entire six or seven weeks, mm -hmm. and the play does not catch on from a word of mouth point of view, right. you know that the play will not survive. It doesn't matter how much uh, television money you push into it, that it will not uh, work. And after a while, the reviews are forgotten. Who done it? Yeah. Got terrible reviews. And it's. An it's awful thing to say on television. But it did. <laughs> it didn't get good reviews. But audiences, obviously, enough of an audience likes it so that it has run. Now it opened uh, the end of December. How do you account for that? About $750,000 or $800,000 poured, of it, poured yeah. into okay. it. It's, yes, but there was a lot of advertising. It's falsely however, subsidized. However, if. That's true. No, it is true. There was a lot of advertising. That is true. So it overcame the initial negative reviews. It's play, but, it's not even breaking it's even. Not, yeah, it is breaking even. Bro but er, it is you, you oh, it is breaking even. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. To do twenty thousand dollars worth it's, of business. It's 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 barely breaking even. But the point is that obviously, it, the advertising got people enough people to make your weekly nut into the theater. How much have they? Why are the producers over doing this? Hmm? Why are the producers doing this? Spending this much they money think on a that show at that some point, at reviews. some point, they think that uh, word of mouth will carry. I mean, they are doing. 70, approximately 70, 80,000 a week. There were a couple of weeks where they dropped during the snow period, but they've been doing 70 or 80, and that's a play that breaks at about 65. It's, it's also a mystery, which is And it's a mystery, a so there is, a, there is some kind of word of but mouth. They figure at some point. They've spent over a million dollars. They have spent over. I'm not saying they're going to make their money they've back. They've spent over a million? On the production. How long do you have to run for <laughs> a movie? Trip. For how long do you have to run for a movie deal? Oh, you can run forever for a movie. No, I mean, is it, no, it, what, is, what is the limited time of, of running? Does, I, don't, I don't think Not that makes a to, difference. To, to answer the, some of the question about the reviews and how quickly they're forgotten, I worked on a mystery. It was called Death Trap. And <laughs> about two years into the run, nobody remembered that the New York Times had killed the show. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, killed it when it opened. Gave it, and the New York Daily News hated it. The exception that proves the rule, though. That's what that really but is. But no, if you, can, if you can get into a run at some point, you can overcome the Mystery, mysteries if you're there long enough, people, people tend to forget that, uh, you know, what the reviewer said. If you're there for four months, nobody's going to remember you, but the Times didn't like that because there's so much else that has come. I think one of the reasons, Isabel, the producers do spend this money, uh, all this money on, uh, for getting very little box office, is that if they can get a long run, it strengthens their position for a movie sale. It strengthens their position for a movie sale, uh, but it also strengthens the position as far as regional theater production is going. I mean, again, oh, going back oh, to Who Done It, there is a lot of interest now. It's been running, and it's an eight-character mystery in one set. The regional theaters are excited. There is talk about a tour, because there aren't that many plays this season, play plays, that can go out on the road. And here they say, it's a mystery, eight characters. Mm -hmm. There is interest it's in from, from theaters that have subscriptions out of town. There was a play that was produced several years ago at the Helen Hayes Theater about a prize fighter uh, and there was an actual ring on stage. The producer, for some reason, kept the play on almost the entire season yeah. at about a $50,000 a week loss. We have no reason, we have no idea why he did it, but he did it. He's no longer producing. No. He's no longer producing. <laughs> you don't know where he is. We know why. I'm going to change the subject a little. I want to know what, Mr. Martin, uh, what attracts a producer to a backer's audition? To a backer's audition. Vice versa. You get invited, well, usually the producer has got the script before he has the backer's audition. Oh, yeah? Um, I want to know what would bring you to uh, something that I want to have produced. Uh, well, you'd example. have to send the script to the producer. 
I mean, you don't bring a producer to a backers audition. Uh, uh, the producer would bring backers to a backers audition if he had accepted the property to produce. Uh, you have to get the play to Irv Schwartz here, and Irv Schwartz will read it and say, I like it, and he sends it to a producer, and uh, the producer, because uh, he respects uh, the agent, will read it, and uh, he will decide to do it. Take an option on it. So the person I should hit to Eric Schwartz would be Eric Schwartz. Schwartz. There <laughs> yes. Okay. There. Thank, Thank you. you. My question is addressed to everybody on the panel. Aside from regional theater, where the author receives royalties, what has happened to road shows? You just mentioned road shows. I'm talking about road. Wonderful theaters equipped theaters in condominiums, halls, in small towns where people are so anxious to go to theater, like a whodunit or Angel's Ball. Well, Sam, well, there, there are a lot of theaters that, that are under uh, regional or, or stock or amateur contracts that contract with, uh, uh, I don't know what type of theaters you're talking about. I'm right? talking about equity. Equity touring, touring, equity touring, touring, touring first shows. Class, yes. First class touring shows? First class touring shows. It's Have expensive. any of you thought about getting together with equity and having them relax their demands? As expensive as a show is to do in New York, the costs to do it on the road, the operating costs each way, I mean, you can tell more than I can, a double. Well, well they why? have bus and truck tours now, though, of practically. You know, practically every hit show ends up with a bus and truck tour which goes into lots of, you know, small towns. I mean, you can't go into tiny towns with it, but certainly they go to all the smaller towns. I mean, I was with the Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, which had a bus and truck that traveled around this country going to every possible place they well, could why go. Aren't there are two there more of those? There, there, there are two tours of Amadeus well, out right now. because I think why? Basically, because there wouldn't be the support unless it's a show like Whorehouse or that's, Amadeus. That's the key. Right. I, I believe that the local entrepreneur has uh, ceased to be uh, a true innovator. And uh, there used to be a time when there was subscription on the road. And, and uh, the Theatre Guild had subscriptions all the way across the country so that you could take a show out and you knew there was a certain amount of subsidy for that play that you could take to that theatre. Now, if you don't have a subscription in a theatre on the road, uh, you can go in and you can lose all the money that you've raised for that road tour and last a week and have to close. The local entrepreneur has not right. done his job right. in the last 10 years to build his subscriptions. Well, there's a new kind of theater in Florida. The condominiums, I don't know if you've ever visited any of the gorgeous theaters and in the universities where there are beautiful theaters and they are willing to go no matter who's in the play or how it's publicized because uh, the, uh, they know that they are going someplace every week. How large are these theaters? I'm not oh, sure there are some of them have about. 500, 750 seats. Well, well see, that's, that, that's not for a show, and they maybe have one, show. they'll have one performance or two performances. I the costs of a show right. are enormous. So take I know they're in, enormous. It I thought they could be too, done something about the cost. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Whittemore, and I've just written a musical, and so I have a problem. Uh, getting back to Broadway, I think we'll all agree that the prob biggest problem is the financial problem because of the economic situation in the country. And you were mentioning earlier about how difficult it is for a playwright to get a straight play on Broadway because of the, for a choice of the same price, a person will choose a musical. And I was wondering if it would not be beneficial if the producers could scale the ticket price to the cost of the production so that the audience would have an option uh, of going to a musical at a higher price or attending a, a play and keeping them all going because it's astronomically more expensive to put on a musical. Well, musicals are higher in price. I mean, as far as the ticket prices, the musical has now gone up to 45 and nibbling away at 50, I mean, from what I can see. But there's not really that much difference. Oh, yes, yes sir. it's about $10 or $15 well, I mean, difference. It is a musical now that has reduced its price to 35 Yes, but a musical theater is usually fifteen to 1,700 seats at $50, say, 45 to $50 a ticket. A legitimate house is maybe 1,000. Most of them are 999 seats because of an old union rule. And uh, so there's a lot of difference between 900 seats 
uh, with usually a second balcony and 1,700 seats and the difference and almost twice the, uh, the amount per ticket. Uh, I noticed that On My Toes recently put on the balcony seats for $10 for the previews. No, that's my, no, that's my one and only. Uh, my one and only. I'm yes. sorry. Um, I was wondering possibly if the, if the producers would not arrive at a, a, more, a least less expensive preview and bring in the audiences originally to recoup more of their costs at the lower preview price, that, if this might not be helpful. Well, with Angels Fall, we had a tremendous discount operation. We sent out thousands and thousands of student discount tickets. We also had a big uh, buy through the Theater Development Fund, which we were selling tickets to them. They, uh, I think they were $5, and we got $8 out of it, I think. That, but they were selling them at $5 to their, to their people. And uh, thousands of people came to see Angels Fall, but we couldn't operate on that alone. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Martin, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for bringing Angels Fall out. I saw the play, admittedly wearing dungarees, but I thought it was a wonderful piece of drama. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, the, the question I had was that since it, it was an important uh, play by uh, Lanford Wilson, was any thought given to possibly taking it from an off-Broadway house to another off-Broadway house as opposed to going straight to Broadway? Yes, there was. There was one uh, off-Broadway house available. Uh, on the weekend following uh, the close. There was only one off-Broadway house available. And uh, it actually was booked, uh, I think, uh, the day before we had our meeting is to decide right. whether like a, that's how the we were going to play. Went into, that's it? right. So there was no, there was theater, no theater actually at that time to take the play off-Broadway. The deciding factor really was, would the cast hold together for an off-Broadway production, and they would not. No. Thank you. Uh, yes, my question is for Mr. Mulhern. At what point after option does a producer hire a general manager? When does the general manager begin work? And when does he start being paid? <laughs> <laughs> With Elliot, very late. <laughs> <laughs> What was the first question, Al? <laughs> um, At what point after option does the producer hire a general manager? Well, Elliot, when you work with a producer the way I do with Elliot, we discuss and work together on many, many projects. Some Good of them question. don't happen and some do. With something like Angels Fall, it all happened very fast. Elliot called me one day, said, I want you to go down and see the play. I went down to see it. We were actually, I was practically on salary the next day. I mean, we, we really started working. Elliot and I are now working on several Generally, projects. Generally, what's the answer to that? Hmm? Generally, what's the answer to that? It usually takes from one to two years to develop a play yeah. for Broadway. Uh, after uh, an option is taken on a property, we will sit down and we will discuss the concept of the production. A budget will be drawn as a result of that concept how we want to do it, whether we want to take it out of town or do it for previews in New York or just how you want to do it. Develop the budget so that you know what, how much money you need to raise for that production. The budget has to come first. Then you have to go to your attorney and you draw a limited partnership agreements and then to start to raise your money. But it, uh, Leonard could draw a budget uh, for a project that doesn't uh, materialize for two years. But and he's he not on, on salary. No, 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 not at all. Why do you go on salary? Well, I usually go on salary the first rehearsal. Oh, I see. Okay. But I very often get a fee in front for the work that I do prior to the rehearsal. We'll have to continue these questions after the program because I have to say something about the American Theatre Wing. I'm, I don't have to say it, but I want to say it. The American <laughs> Theatre Wing is a nonprofit organization. We work year-round to bring professional theatre into hospitals, into schools, we present these seminars on working in the theater twice a year, and they are comprised of the most knowledgeable people that we can find who give us their time and their energies and their knowledge and their expertise to share it with the students and the people in the theater that are here. This is part of the American Theater Wing's commitment to servicing the community through the theater. The Tony Award which occurs once a year on national television, is always associated with the wing. However, 
when it was created by, in honor of Antoinette Perry, it was created for achieving a degree of excellence in the theater. Not for the best, not for the longest run, or not for the biggest box office receipts. And I think that people like we've had today, and the people that were on the performance seminars, and the people who were on the play script seminars, are all committed to that same kind of wanting an excellence in the theater. And these seminars are part of that whole picture of what, what goes into creating excellence in the theater. The wing is made up of volunteers, and we need volunteers badly. And these seminars and many other things that we do are manned by volunteers. So I'd like right now to thank Luann and Rochelle and Mary and Florence and Peter and Phyllis and Ida and Michael Tucci, our program director, and Lynn Delaney for helping so very much, both in the office and for the gathering together of the talent and all the work that goes out to making working in the theater a really working seminar. To the producers that are here today of Angels Fall and to your staff, to the people that go in, make up part of the whole production of Angels Fall, thank you very, very much to Henry and to Jean as well. Thank you very much, and I hope that I see you all again. Bye-bye. Thank you for coming. <laughs>